A very good morning to all. Welcome to another edition of TOSB Conversations, a platform that brings perspective from leading experts across diverse fields, talk about the ideas that TOSP Conversations are presented by the Outstanding Speakers Bureau, which works with leading minds from across the globe who deliver experiential knowledge on topics ranging from storytelling to boardroom philosophies, digital transformation, leadership, managing self, diversity, policy making, economic landscape, amongst others. I'm Kriti Makija, your host for the conversation today. I'm a CFO by profession, a volunteer by choice, a joyous mother of a 21 year old and my own best friend. I'm a learner for life and I love reading, traveling, cooking, Excel sheets, numbers, but most importantly, I love life. Have you heard of this famous quote? It is not the answer that enlightens, but the question. Well, I have not just heard this, but have experienced this. Whether you want to be happier or become a better leader, a better a better human being, asking right questions can help you move to a more conscious path and enable better choices. When your own awareness level goes up, you're not just aware about your own self, but becoming more aware of everyone around you. You also learn how you impact others. And this is just so important for leaders to understand. Many leaders think that this self-awareness only impacts well, that's a myth. It's a VUCA world. Leaders really need to learn to ask questions. For me, I've always been curious, full of questions. And as I grew older, questions about life, relationships, be it at work or home, failure or loss of life, to taking a large part of my mind space, creating a lot of clutter with no answers or externalizing my problems. Larger level, and both of this led to a loss of optimism, productivity, and happiness levels. And in one such lockjam situations of teamwork, our guest for this decision. You know what? I went to her in a state of confusion with multiple questions and came back empowered by changing questions I was asking. She me unlock the magic self aware. It helped me take charge of my life. My today I'm absolutely in conversation. An optimistic and empathetic human being who brings simplicity, authenticity, and commitment to whatever she chooses to do. As a coach and facilitator, she loves supporting individuals and organizations to be their best with three decades of experience. Katrina has learned the importance of balancing the philosophical with the practical. She immensely enjoys conducting the happiness and positivity workshops, which she has run for over a decade now. The human mind fascinates Katrina, and she's constantly exploring its vast potential. She's also the co-author of a book on facilitation. Welcome, Katrina. And thank you so much, Katrina. Over. Well, it's an absolute delight. And I have to tell you that I was intrigued by the title of this conversation. I know we first asked you to speak on happiness and positivity and want Lost your voice, Kriti. Sorry, lost your voice, Kriti, so I can um, get... So, yeah, sorry, again. Um, so, you know, um, Nasreen, when we started talking about uh, this TOSB conversation, we first asked you to speak on happiness and positivity. And I wanted yeah. to know why did you choose the title, Taking Charge of Your Life? <laughs> um, that's interesting. Actually, you're right. Uh, when the first conversation was about happiness and positivity, and I remember you saying, how do you stay so optimistic? <laughs> so I do remember that. Uh, what I started thinking was that happiness is really something that we all uh, go for. And that's, you know, if you just Google happiness or something, you'll get some, I don't know how many books on happiness. But where does it start from? 
the way I see it, it starts from exploring oneself. And what better way to do that than to ask questions? So when I start thinking, okay, if I were to ask you a simple question like, okay, how happy are you? You probably have an answer coming up pretty quickly. You know, you may just give it yourself a rating and say, okay, I'm this happy. But if I change the question and say, okay, what does happiness mean to you? What does it look like? Then it starts, you know, making you think. And so I thought, okay, we, I know you want me to talk about happiness and optimism, which I will, wherever you want, but why not start from what helped me start on my journey of uh, becoming happier and more optimistic? Uh, the other part, which also I, um, I think why I chose to bring it up was that, you know, in my work with corporates, what I'm realizing is that there are many leaders now coming and talking about how anxious they are feeling because of the state of affairs. And we've had a year which all of us have dealt with. Uh, and sometimes I think if they only asked more questions of their team, things would be different. And so I thought, okay, let's engage in this and maybe it can help someone and why not? Let's, let's try it. So yeah, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm also really grateful for the people who've taken out a Saturday uh, morning to come and you know engage in this conversation. It's really, really lovely. And I'd encourage all of them to be more than free to put things on the chat window because I'm more than, like I told you, Kriti, I'm okay with whatever you comes up and we'll just flow with it. Well, Nasreen, you. that's you. Always human, always empathetic, always about picking up um, what's troubling people or what can unlock their potential. And also um, your your thought on why you chose this topic was very, very insightful. And I completely agree with you. You can't let life happen to you. You have to take charge of your life and make life happen. And to do so, you need to ask the right questions. Jumping right into the conversation, my first question to you is why coaching? Well, we all know that coaching helps unlock a person's potential to maximize growth. But what inspired you to be a coach and what was your first experience of coaching like? <laughs> Don't ask me my first experience of coaching because that's quite funny. <laughs> but uh, So let me just talk about a little bit about what coaching is because people understand it differently and then I'll talk about uh, the experience I had, my first experience. So the difference, I didn't understand for a very, very long time. Um, what is the difference between coaching or counseling or mentoring? And then I figured, and for me, it was only sports coaches, you know, how coaches, you just know of people who are, you know, a cricket coach and a badminton coach and all of that. Uh, and then when I got into this, I realized that when somebody says, okay, I, I am a coach, what they mean is that they help people discover themselves through asking questions. Now, I didn't know this for a long time. I mean, that's what coaching is. So actually, when, I, when we say, okay, how can you ask the right question? You can also say, okay, it's about coaching yourself in a way. Um, but this is more enlightened time than I'm telling you this. Uh, so how I got my first experience of coaching wasn't, wasn't, shall I say, I didn't even know I was being coached, honestly. And this goes back some, I don't know, 25, 26, 28 years ago. So I was into my, one of my first jobs and um, uh, I was in the marketing department and I was, you know, the 23, 24 year old who's very eager to prove herself. Um, and I was made in charge of a book launch that was going to happen. The CEO of the company was going to launch a book. So the, the book launch was going to be, let's say, two days later. Hmm. And uh, the printer I was working with, uh, he calls me and he tells me, Madam, wo, wo printing to not be because the logo ka ink, hai, the color of the ink is not available. So he tells me he's not going to be able to print the book. And imagine that's resting on my shoulders, okay? So I got really quite nervous and I thought to my, let me just go to my boss and say, you know, this is where it is and I'm stuck. Now I'll tell you a little bit about this organization. And, you know, it was like a little bit of uh, the office look like what, uh, you know, some of the government offices look like. So imagine, you know, the, he, he used to have the, my boss used to have a cabin, wooden cabin with, with large glass windows um, and this, you know, L-shaped desk with one, desktop computer, which was the only one in that time, huh? in, in his room, whatever. So I run up the stairs, he's sitting on the fifth floor and I knock and um, he says, okay, come in. Uh, and I say, sir, there's a problem. So uh, it was, it's, it's very interesting. So he looks at me, tells me, sit down. Okay, uh, what's the problem? 
So I rattle it all off. I'm like really nervous. And I say, you know, there is no ink. There is no way the book can be launched and whatever. He says, okay, okay. And, you know, he had this very interesting system, uh, Kriti. I mean, I sometimes laugh at it. So all of us knew it. And we used to say, okay, it's time to munch peanuts. We weren't used to that, okay? So he makes me sit down. He very slowly goes to the left drawer of his, the first drawer. And he takes out some peanuts. Can you believe it? Here I am nervous about what's, what to do. And he's taking out peanuts, okay? And then there was this little white bowl that he used to keep on the side. He brings that up and he puts it between us. So, so I'm sitting on the other side of the table. Now there is a bowl on which he slowly puts the peanuts. So now it's a little bowl, like these Lao Pala desert bowls that come in, no, chota chota bowls, okay? And now the, the rule is, he says, okay. Uh, so he's, un, he's asked me what the problem is. What, what, so the so question is, what have you tried? So I tell him what I've tried. Now, what you have to do is that till the peanuts are over, you can't speak. Okay, so he takes a peanut and I'm supposed to munch the peanuts and he would say, yeah, yeah, with, with peanuts, your brain is going to become more active. Okay, now the point is I'm waiting and looking at that bowl to finish because till the bowl finishes, we are not going to talk. Okay, and he's sitting there and he sort of rocks in his chair and he says, okay, uh, after he's asked me, what's the problem? What have you tried? He says, okay, so now what can we do? And then he says, okay, what else can we do? And neither of us are talking, okay? He's talking to himself. After the peanuts finish, which is a cool five, seven minutes, by then I've actually got 10 ideas of what we could do. Because I'm so nervous and I think he's not gonna do anything for me. So when he finishes, then he says, okay, what have you thought of? And then I write off, okay, maybe we can get the, you know, we can maybe just do a photocopy of the page for now on a great paper. I try all kinds of things. And then he asked me, okay, which one would you choose? Uh, and I sort of say whatever I do, and then he leads me through it, okay? But at that time, Kriti, I can't tell you how frustrating it was. I used to think, I mean, why does he, and this is not only to me, we used to, we were four, four people who joined the same batch, and we used to say, oh no, I'll be time to munch peanuts. He used to do this for all of us, okay? Uh, it is only much later that I figured what he was doing beautifully was he was coaching me through my problem. I didn't realize it then. It's only when I, you know, about 15 years later or whatever, so I'm really embarrassed about this <laughs> because we used to just say, he's so slow, he's so slow. <laughs> Instead of realizing, in fact, you know what this munching of peanuts used to do is slow down the thinking. And much later when I started reading and then you had the Daniel Kahneman talking about how you can you should do slow thinking. I thought, my God, when we used to do it, I, still, I never valued it. But I think my first lessons I learned on coaching from him. Um, and he used to have, uh, in fact, be besides that, now that I look back, uh, we used to have every Friday of the month. Uh, yeah, last Friday of the month, he used to call the four of us. We used to report to him and ask us really, really weird questions. He'd say, okay, in that meeting, you don't speak at all. So what does it speak about you? No answer, only questions, okay? Then he'd ask my colleague, he said, okay, in that meeting, you continue to speak throughout. What does that show, up, show about you? Then he'd ask questions like, okay, what kind of a leader are you trying to be? One day he saw me sitting late. So he, he asked me the next day, what are you trying to, is it, does sitting late mean you're more effective or more efficient? Or does it mean that you're uh, not effective? So he used to keep doing this. And I think that just, um, uh, you know, we used to have this joke all the time. Okay, time, you know, the other three have gone abroad. And when we still meet, we say, okay, time to munch peanuts. <laughs> so yeah, so I think that was my first experience. Wow, and you know, his mentorship with you is continuing over years. That's just remarkable. And that tells you the power of finding an effective coach uh, in your life, that relationship just grows, Nasreen. It's similar to the way I feel for you, or I felt for um, the coach that I had before you. So, um, you know, we're continuing to get a lot of questions uh, on the chat, and I don't want to, um, you know, but still take a pause and remind the audience, those of you who please who have joined us, please keep sending in your questions. This sure is going to be a conversation with Nasreen Khan, which where you're going to take away a lot. Uh, and we'll try and address all the uh, questions in our conversation. And in any chance that we don't address them, we promise that we'll get back to you often. So moving forward, Nasreen, um, 
As a coach, I know you work with corporates, individuals, teams. Can you share some instances where asking questions uh, change the situation? You know, just thinking about my own experience with you, I vividly remember one when I was stuck in a situation with my mentor and leader, which was just not only impacting our relationship, but the organization at large. With your help and nudging the right direction from a closed ended, externalizing the problem question, I share all the right information and I just cannot understand why am I mostly at the receiving end of the brunt? to a more open, positive, solution-focused question, how can I communicate the facts better and in a simplified way for better consumption and decision-making, took me completely out of the victim mode and helped change my communication approach and facilitate decision-making. You know, would love to hear, well, that's just one from me, would love to hear of more such examples from you that will spark a new thing for our audience. So first of all, Kriti, really, it's it's hats off to you that you did what you did, uh, because I saw you just use that. You know, it's not very easy uh, to reflect on oneself and take the ownership on oneself. So I think one of the first things that I've realized about uh, this aspect of asking oneself questions is um, you'll be willing to to accept that you may not be right, or there might be another way. Uh, and because you talked about this one, one thought that comes to my mind um, is I used to work, uh, I was working with this uh, gentleman who was a lovely person, lovely human being, uh, working with the KPO, the knowledge processing uh, outsourcing industry, and very hardworking, brilliant IIT guys, math stats, brilliant, um, just black and white though, numbers and black and white. And what happened was that he got, he got a double uh, promotion kind of a thing because of how he was doing. And from reporting, so from an AVP, he, I don't know what his, I think he became a VP and he started reporting directly to the CEO. And he said, uh, so one, one meeting I had, and he was really happy and he said, Nasreen, just look at this and I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've got promoted and I'm so happy. And in just the next meeting, he says, Nasreen, I have some bad news. So I said, okay, what's happened? Uh, he said, I'm planning to quit. So I was like really taken aback. I said, planning to quit? I thought you loved this place. He says, I still love the place. I hate my boss. <laughs> I mean, it was really straight, okay? Uh, and uh, I was really, you know, it took me some time because he was so passionate about his work and organization, Kriti, I can't tell you. He really was. Uh, so, you know, I asked him, okay, what did you, he says, you know, I can't get along with, uh, with my boss. Where is the option? I have to leave. So, you know, the question he was asked, telling himself actually was, how, he wasn't asking the question, how can I get along with my boss? Or how, what other options I have? It mm -hmm. was like a yes and no. I can't get along with my boss. Should I stay? Should I go? So what happened was we did a little bit of work where um, I just asked him to change the question and say, okay, two, two different questions. One was, why am I here mm -hmm. in that place? Why do, I, why do I want to be here? And what can I do to make it work for me? And the third one, when he became more open, was what can I do to make it work for my boss? And mm -hmm. I was so happy he messaged me a couple of uh, weeks later that I actually had the courage to tell my boss, let's go out for a drink and I want to talk to you. And he actually went and shared whatever he did. And his boss said, thank God you've told me if you had to quit, it would have been really horrible. So I still remember and he went on to become the CEO, COO and all that. And I, I mean, I was just, I just thought that little change, uh, he would have left and gone and he stayed on for six more years. So yeah, that comes to mind for sure. Wow. That's, um, that sounds like, um, living life example, which I'm sure many of us have experienced in our life, because I always say that people don't leave jobs, they leave people and the experiences that they create for each other. Um, and, you know, hearing such life examples uh, from you, Nasreen, they make theories and practices clear and something that can be adopted by each one of us and practice for a better life. And on that note, requesting the audience to please share with us a question that changed the outlook of, for their life. You never know, your question may change the trajectory of someone else's life too. And uh, Nasri, I have to tell you, the chat window is going wild with accolades for munching peanuts, anecdotal story. 
I'm sure. Um, oh, uh, uh, it, not only that, it's it's changed my life till today. When I'm hurrying up, I tell myself, "Okay, time to munch peanuts." Thank God I'm not munching them all the time; otherwise, my size would be different. <laughs> but at least, you know, I stop and I say, "Okay, time to munch peanuts." But um, can I tell you a secret? I uh, munch peanuts before going to sleep every night. Ten. <laughs> I, I didn't know that it's going to uh, get into a revelation of sorts <laughs> of for self awareness, but I do do that uh, every every night before going to bed, <laughs> along with writing my uh, gratitude journal that uh, um, you asked me to write. Uh, oh, you still do that? That's wonderful. That is wonderful. We should talk about that sometime in the, during this uh, okay. when we talk about maybe later. But we'd love to talk about that one. Sure. So go ahead. So taking the conversation forward, Nasreen, um, how can someone who's not a coach start using questions to make better choices to maintain and enhance optimism? Um, and, you know, at this point, I will bring the gratitude journal back. And um, you asked me to keep a daily journal recording highs and lows, what I'd agreed with you to be more aware about, gratitude and learning for the day. Just like that um, is and just like the way health checkup works for our physical health, is there a framework or actionable tips or some regular checkups for optimism that you can share with us? For optimism, okay. Mm, so I think the first question I'd like to ask you and to everybody else is what is, uh, you know, so first of all, I think happiness is overrated. <laughs> it's all right. I mean, we do want to be happy, but, uh, you know, earlier I used to think that happiness is about, uh, you know, how many Oh, everybody, in case you haven't, there's this lovely course called Science of Happiness uh, on, on Coursera, which is from the Yale University. Lots of research on happiness worth uh, everyone to have a look, just, just in case I forget that. But what it talks about is that some of the stuff I used to think would make me happy, whether, you know, an increase in salary would make me happy or getting the next new car would make me happy, or sometimes just a, a new dress I looked at and I thought, okay, I feel like getting this one <laughs> would make me happy. But the point is what keeps you consistently happy. Uh, so that's one thing that I, I want to call out. Uh, and to ask, uh, you know, so optimism is a great word because it's about how do I look at the brighter side of something? Uh, and it may or may not lead me to be happy because if I keep looking at the brighter side of something where I need to do something about it, uh, you know, there are sometimes there are tough choices we have to make, but we don't make them because we are just saying, okay, it'll be all right. So I think that has a balance, but I'll come back to it in a minute, one second. So um, going back to the first thing I want to talk about is that happiness is a choice. People may agree or not agree, but the fact is that it is a choice. Uh, you spoke to me that day and you said, okay, how much of it is genetic? How much is nurture? How much is nature? So yes, there is a percentage which is nature, but of the part that we can change, 80% depends on our responses. Now that's huge, okay? So the easiest thing to do is when you are not feeling too great, you can ask, where am I focusing? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've seen is gratitude helps there because let's say I am, uh, so I, I remember I was talking to somebody and she said, my God, Nasreen, I haven't gone out for so long. I mean, I feel trapped. And I just asked her, where are you focusing? So she said, yeah, I'm focusing on just feeling trapped. I said, okay. But what do you have with you right now that's really working? She said nothing. OK, the first thing was nothing. And then when we started nudging going forward, and this was it was also on a video call like this, she said, yeah, the fact that I'm breathing and there are people with who may have got COVID and are finding it difficult to breathe, the fact that I can smell. And really, for every situation, there is a way to look at it in another way. Can I reframe that? Can I just ask? Another question to that one, okay. Um, um, what can I be grateful for in that moment? Just asking that question will shift a lot. But I think ask me more pointed questions, I'm going all over the place. No, no, you're not. Uh, because everything is uh, bringing the conversation back to what are you focusing on, the problem, or asking better questions to take charge of your life. And on that note, um, Nasreen, uh, you know, we asked the audience to share a question that changed their life. And we have a share from uh, Shreya Pilani. And she says that the question that changed her life was, do I need to continue to be guilty 
and underpaid just because I choose to be a mother? Uh, that was a life changing question and gave her the courage wow. to quit, move on to a place that has helped her gain her self respect back. Wow. Uh, so thank you, Shreya, for sharing that. Wow. I'm sure there will be other questions people can share and uh, they can help everybody. I mean, it's really, really uh, a good one. Yeah, really a good one. Thanks, Shreya. Uh, and I'm, you know, with the with the chat window completely going all over the place, I'm sure the audience are enjoying this conversation as much as I am and getting useful tips for life. And please keep sending in your questions along with your name. And uh, Nasreen, coming back to gratitude. Yes, I remember that conversation with you. Two things. What are you focusing on and what are you grateful for? It will always tell you that life has given you so much to be grateful for that you just cannot write in your gratitude journal. And um, and the challenges that you're perhaps currently facing are just a handful. And if you just focus your energies on the in the right direction, you can change the trajectory of your life. Uh, you know, and I'm not coming from a um, philosophical face um, place because I've experienced this in my coaching with you. And thank you so very much for that. You just, uh, Kriti, as you're speaking, I just remember two instances that happened in one of my NLP. I run this NLP workshop, which is on happiness and positivity. There mm -hmm. is one exercise we were doing. It was just a fun exercise. And the fun exercise was uh, the groups were sitting together and they were uh, just listing down things that they normally cribbed about. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just getting aware because awareness is the first step, right? How do I, if I can't even catch my negative thought, how will I change it, right? Yeah. So, uh, so there was this guy who said, you know, what traffic jams in in Bangalore, Bangalore, you know how it is. Uh, so, ba Bangalore traffic jam, my God. Of course, now it may, may be different, but that's the usual story if you talk to any person in Bangalore. And uh, he said it just takes so long, two hours, three hours. There was another guy, and other, other, the game was such that the other group had to refute whatever this group was saying. So, you know, rephrase it. So he said, okay, why aren't you walking to work? You have a car. And this guy looked at him and he said, yes. Uh, so he said, then what's your problem? So suddenly he realized that he was cribbing about whatever, but he had a car, for example. And then there was this lady who said, you know what, I am most worried if my cook doesn't come in. I have to cook every day and, you know, stuff like that. And then somebody asked her, okay, who are you cooking for? She said, my two kids and my hubby. So this lady turns around and says, you have a family? I lost my husband and my kid to a car accident. I mean, this is live in that room. And I'm like, oh, so what's happening here? And you know, that's something which has stayed with me. That's always, always something that you can find that it's about wanting to. Yeah, you're so right. And it's eerie. You know, it reminds me of that uh, story that, um, um, you know, I'm cribbing about the bad shoes and here there's another person who doesn't have uh, legs. So, yes, there's so much. You know, uh, so I'm going to share one more thing. Sorry, I'm, I, some, because the moment you said this, I have again remembered something that really helps. And um, so I was, uh, I was working with this uh, CEO of a firm mm -hmm. and the firm has has gone really high up and come down. So mm -hmm. let's say I'm just making these figures up so that the firm is not uh, understood, but uh, uh, cannot be traced out. So let's say it was a 10,000 crore company last year. Okay. And it, when it started, obviously it started with, it's an entrepreneur driven firm. So it started with nothing almost, right? And then it becomes, it goes down to say a 2000 crore company. What do we look at? We say, okay, I was here and I've gone down. So I'm unhappy. I never see I started with a with maybe 100 bucks and I've reached here or I started with a crore or two crores or 10 crores, whatever it is. And I reached here. So it's always our choice. Where am I measuring with? What am, what is it related to? That's again a choice. And I think the question to ask, therefore, is uh, what am I making a choice? Do I want to be happy? That's that's an important choice. And that's that's happened. Uh, you know, I've actually asked somebody that question. Uh, and he said, yeah, um, uh, do you want to be happy? And when will, when you, when will you allow yourself to be happy? Uh, so I remember this was a question in December. So I asked him because I said, when will you allow yourself to be happy? He looks at me straight. He stops for a bit. He says, 20th Jan. I said, what? <laughs> so, so it is, you know, sometimes we, are, we don't even realize that we are doing that. So sometimes when you're not being able to feel very optimistic or feel very happy, ask yourself, when will you allow yourself to be happy? 
and you'll find that something will shift. Wow, that's a great takeaway. When will you allow yourself to be happy? I'm going to, I'm going to uh, steal that though. I have to tell you, my happiness button is always on when I'll allow myself to be happier uh, can be the next <laughs> question. Absolutely. Yeah. No, uh, but that's, that's, that's fantastic, Nasreen. And, uh, you know, real life examples, again, uh, you know, that's beautiful about talking to you because every time we talk to you, you give us real life examples, which which takes the practice of self-awareness, gratitude, asking the right questions from a theoretical um, point to a very practical space. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, and this is an also a question from uh, someone in the group. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the person. But what are the warning signs that one should pick up to know that life is going off track or things are getting out of control, either in your personal space uh, or as a leader, and that you do need help? Um, few, and, you know, there is also this thing, uh, Nasreen, few pick up these signs, but they believe that it can be self-corrected. So how important it is, is it to have a coach in such situations? Uh, so I think there are two things there, Kriti. One is uh, if life is going off track um, in the sense of am I beginning to lose focus? Am I beginning to lose energy? So there are two different things. If I'm beginning to lose focus, let's say on a goal or in my job, that may be different. But if I'm beginning to lose interest in life, that is serious and we are going somewhere else, which is, it could be, a, you know, you get moving into feeling a little depressed or something, which is a, which is an alarm. That's a different, that's, that's a part which you need to take professional psychiatric help if ever that happens. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, I, I know of so many people who have been depressed and are perfectly happy and optimistic today. So it's a good thing to do, get help. At the most, what will happen is they'll say, okay, you're, you're fine. You just need to correct something that you're doing, which is good. So that's one. The other piece is it's very interesting that you say life is going off track. I've met very few people who know what is life when it's on track. And I'll tell you why. Because we haven't stopped and thought. If I ask you the question, when you are going to say my life is 10 on 10 on track, what exactly would be happening? Hmm. So to think, okay, what does success look like for me when life is on track? What does it look like for me? And if it looks like something, then only do I know if it's going off track. Yeah. So I don't know whether that's making any sense. There. No, absolutely. So again and again, you know, what I'm hearing you and also some of the, pan, uh, you know, audiences also taking away from this is at every crossroads, at every time you are challenged, challenge what is challenging you. Focus on what do you want from life. And, you know, in that uh, lies your answer. And I have to share with you what Umesh shares um, with us on gratitude. He says he fought with a disease for a long time at a young age and still has to bear effects of it. But during this whole journey, he evolved hugely. And what helped him was in a focus, self-talks and his guru. And um, wow. he has immense gratitude uh, oh, for, wow. for all the people who have helped him and have uh, helped him in his journey. So he does agree that gratitude is a phenomenal em emotion and makes you calm and happier. You know, if, 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 if on happiness, we could take away just one thing, Kriti, just one, I would say just, and, and when you see the research, uh, the kind of impact being grateful has on your optimism levels is amazing. And if just one thing people wanted to do post this for their happiness levels is to write, three things they're grateful for every day, end of the day, just three. And write, writing does something because it's sort of, you have to, it makes you go through it again. So that automatically just shifts the space. So, so before you move on, I thought I'll just, because of Umesh's lovely, um, you know, the, the input that he's put in, this would be really useful. Absolutely. And um, Nasreen, keeping the gratitude journal has helped me immensely. So I can, I can, um, um vouch for it actually so uh, yeah, moving to next uh moving on to the next one and you know i'm going to talk a little bit about leadership you know leadership is not easy and with close to two decades of being a leader i can place a hand on my heart and say that uh and especially in times like the present ones mm -hmm. where leaders have have to take tough decisions which impact the life and livelihood of people 
What is your advice on how leaders can continue to be optimistic and create a positive outlook, uh, especially in such times with their teams? Mm. So I think um, with the work that I've been doing with leaders, what I've been noticing is that we, it's also a little bit about our culture, I think, and how we've been brought up, is that a leader in the past days used to be somebody who knew everything. That's how you're supposed to be a leader, right? Confident, uh, uh, give decisions immediately, and you know everything. And that's why you sort of have become a leader. That's how you, you were successful doing all that. That's how you became a leader, for example. Okay. There is a definition of leadership that we will be living with, which is, okay, I need to know everything. I need to, I'm the one who's confident and, you know, I have all the answers. That's a way of putting a huge amount of pressure on yourself. That's one. The second is that if you're doing that, you're actually not getting the 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 knowledge of the other players in your team and i've uh, again i was working with someone which is a very interesting one we had uh, during this pandemic time uh, somebody in the manufacturing sector and he said it's such a i mean i was really so touched and moved he said nasreen i made plan a it failed because next day pandemic something else happened uh, i made plan b then the factory got shut down because that region got shut down i made plan c i think i will make plan z by the end of it and I don't know what to do. Uh, and I just asked him, I said, what makes you think you have to know what to do? And he stopped. Uh, and he said, because, you know, I, I'm heading the sales. Uh, so I asked him, but what is the kind of team you have? And then he had a large team and all of that. And then we just, with a few questions, we moved him to saying, okay, could he ask his people on the ground? What are possible options? Because neither does he know, nor does anybody in the world know what to do with it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so just and uh, so he came back to me uh, about what three, four months ago, and now he has a monthly conversation meeting where he doesn't speak and he asks questions. And he mm -hmm. says, because now this is giving him in inputs that are coming from people on the ground. Now, what also happens when you ask questions, Kriti, is let's say I was the salesperson who gave you this idea, okay, mm -hmm. and you implemented this idea. Imagine my ownership. Yeah. I feel empowered. I feel I have ownership. And so I end up doing that. But if, I, if I'm always told what to do, then I stop thinking. If there's a problem, I don't solve it on the ground. I go back and wait for my leader to tell me what to do. Absolutely. So I think and it's a skill that asking questions is a skill that people will have to learn in this new way of living. Absolutely, Nasreen. And that's really been the classical shift from uh, leaders who knew it all, did it all to a shared collaborative leadership environment. And you and I both have the privilege of knowing one such person uh, that I have uh, the joy of working with, Prema Sagar. Absolutely. Uh, taking her name because she's my mentor, my guide. She took the punt on 25 year old me to be the CFO of an organization and has yeah. never directed me what I'd need to do. And you're right, it's built so much of accountability and responsibility and ownership uh, in me that I always want to do more, be better. And you know, in the, in the kind of person she is, she's not just done that for me, but for all my other six, seven colleagues who started in this uh, journey with her. So yes, that's the power of asking the questions, uh, being collaborative in your approach and raising your hand and saying, I do not have a solution. Uh, yeah. We workshop a solution. So that's just uh, that's just brilliant. And thank you for sharing um, the story of this gentleman because uh, being challenged in this time, Nasreen, was um, it's very tough. Really true really. for everyone. And Every you know, uh, I can tell him that I did uh, plans from A to Z, and I'm perhaps at, perhaps at. AP now, you know, there are so many <laughs> versions of plans and every day there was a new googly that was thrown away. But on that note, uh, I have another question from Mukesh from our audience asking mm -hmm. how to coach team members who are always comparing themselves with their peers uh, and feeling unhappy. Hmm, interesting. Uh, so it's about figuring out why is the person doing this comparison? There could be several reasons. One could just be that I have a self-esteem issue. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not getting appreciated enough. Uh, so 
one of the things asking questions does is, and they've done research on this. I'll, in fact, there's an HBR HBR article. If you if we have email IDs, I can send it to the you know the group that is there with us, uh, which talks about how asking good questions develops relationships very beautifully and should be done with teams. Mm -hmm. So let's say there was a conversation by which I knew this person really well. And so I understood why is he feeling the need to compare himself? Is there genuinely a lack of something that he, you know, that the organization is not giving or the leader is not giving? Or is there a lack inside him? And sometimes just using something called appreciative inquiry, which are questions related, but they're positive questions. You know, you've already done this well. What else can you do on this? Things like that can help a person feel better about himself. So I don't know what is in this case, but again, having a conversation open-ended. Oh yeah, yeah. One big one here, Kriti, is not to be judgmental during this conversation. Yeah. That's the biggest one. If the person feels you are talking to the person to judge the person, it's not going anywhere. So Mukesh, my, my thought to you would be, get to know the person and you will find an answer to this one. And to get to know the person, they'll have to ask, ask open-ended questions, open-ended deep questions that'll be required. So I, I, you know, I might also just talk a little bit about what are right and wrong questions, if it's okay, Kriti? Yes, please. That's a question from uh, Mr. Kurana, who's uh, with us today. He's asked right and wrong questions and right and better questions. So Okay, uh, nice. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, I don't know about right and wrong, literally, but every question is good or bad in a context, right? Uh, and any question which makes you stop and think is a good question. However, the tone in which I ask the question will decide whether it becomes useful for the person who will be asked the question or not. And that's an important one. For example, let me, um, you know, if, if there's a question that we ask a lot of people, what would you do about this problem if you knew you could not fail? Okay. It's a mm. question which makes you think, okay, I cannot fail. And it's making you think of options that you could do. And it's giving yeah. you the sense I can try. So a question which moves you forward is a good question. And uh, when you say it's a, is, what a right, how, when does it become a right question? It is by the tonality and the words you use and the place where it's used. And all this comes by practice, no big deal. We anyway use questions to ourselves all the time. So there's nothing to feel to, you know, like this is seeming too difficult. No, it's not. You can just begin by asking yourself one question. That's good enough. And you make it sound so simple. So it's the tone, tonality, the right question that helps you think. And I think um, that's a big takeaway for me as a leader who works with um, diverse teams and also not just um, works with diverse teams, cross-cultural cross borders, it really does help, um, you know, so I'm, that's my takeaway. Uh, and, you know, Danish on that asks a tongue in cheek question. Uh, does it give you an advantage as a coach, coach to ask better questions? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> it sure does. I think I'm in the best profession on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, Danish, it surely does. <laughs> I'd encourage you to just go ahead and, and learn that skill. And, Again, there are enough, if anybody, if you, if any of the people want Kriti, we can send them a list of possible questions. We can do whatever. See the intention. Remember when you spoke to me, you said, why would you do this? I said, if it can help even one person, it's worth doing this, right? So if one person can ask a better question to themselves, we, we are done. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and um, Nasreen, uh, we were talking about this yesterday also. It is about paying forward. Yes, being a coach, of course, you're far better equipped to ask the right question, tone, tonality, time. But even, you know, uh, in sessions with you and what I've picked up with you, if there is one person that I can influence with my learnings, that's paying yeah. it for. And I think um, every person that you touch um, is meaningful. Uh, so, yes, uh, Dani. So, so there's a question right here to the audience. So at the end of this talk, what is one thing you can do that will help pass this message to somebody else. Just one thing. Wow, that's brilliant. So you, uh, so everybody in the audience, you have a homework and we look forward to hearing back from you. And you know, uh, again, going back to what I started this conversation, in your question will lie the answer. And that will, of course, help uh, you move forward. So um, Nasreen, coming back to the cliche happiness. So 
uh, well spent uh, some time on that but um, how can we use questions to always keep the happy button always on is there something specific that you uh, recommend doing from that perspective i think the i can only think of what really helps me which is just asking myself do i want to feel this way so i do this very often I, in fact you were telling me that day do you get angry and i said yes of course i do <laughs> it's just that i come back faster <laughs> but it's about the awareness to say okay how am i feeling right now and to ask a second question do i want to feel this way hmm. and then to say okay if i didn't want to feel this way what is one thing that i could focus on instead of whatever i'm focusing on it will shift i mean we can just try anything that you want um and we can just work on that if if it helps anybody that's um that's uh, that's that's really uh, fantastic and i have a question from varsha chitnis uh, she says nasreen i'm curious to know what was one experience as a coach that changed the way you coach today oh lovely question varsha so i blundered very badly <laughs> uh, and that changed the way i coach uh, and i think that's it's a great question i'll tell you why because when we start learning something sometimes in our excitement we are overdoing it so even when you start start asking yourself questions please don't overdo it <laughs> ask some questions but it can't be the for every part of my life i'm saying okay should i have the glass of water or should i not i mean it can't be that much right but what happened was when you are asking let's say you're a leader and you're going to begin asking questions you also have to have that bowl of peanuts there right because you have to allow time for the other one to respond now when i started learning how to coach i was just so excited about all the questions i knew now <laughs> and before waiting for the other one i'm thinking of what's the next question i will ask so i it, it was a disaster so i think whenever we are doing any process of inquiry or reflection or one needs to come from a space of curiosity and deep respect for whatever comes up from the other person side that's really really essential it's not about asking the next right question it's about being with that person uh, and i learned it the hard way because this guy looked at me and he said uh, i don't think i need to answer that and i looked at him and i thought oh my god what happened and of course it was a blunder it was absolutely my mistake so yeah well uh, that's that's uh, re really remarkable and that's what we hear about good conversation is also that it's not just being ready with your questions with your response but listening being in the moment being present are you really listening are you really hearing the person so i think that's a that's a great uh, insight that you've shared i have another question from um, someone i'm just looking at that i'm forgetting the name but it was a nice one and it said uh, walk um, not walk behind your team be the wind beneath their wing would you say that this pretty much sums up what leaders should do uh yes because if i go back to the same person i spoke about uh what he would do um is that he would let us choose what we wanted to do but if it failed he'd really stand for us so we knew that if we make a mistake he's not going to put us in front and say okay she made the mistake at that time he used to be the backbone you could fall back on him and say okay you know so yeah that's a great one uh, i i would say yes it is so don't don't just hang them dry uh, yeah I'll... because you have to ownership is finally the buck stops on you i guess absolutely and i uh, manpreet asks a question that there is a system originating from america which says every time you come to me with a problem come with three solutions what's your take on that uh i've worked with that one uh, the question came from you said manpreet 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 yeah manpreet uh, yes you're right uh, this is very easy to start with and i think uh, it's a, i'm so glad you're talking about this because when leaders when we talk to leaders and we try and tell them listen you know you can start asking them for solutions most people don't know how to do it then the simplest is it's almost like a framework you say okay fine any time anybody comes with a problem please come with at least three options now i'll tell you what happens here also uh, we are used to our normal styles so you come to me and you give me three options i say kriti okay very good one two three please go for two 
That's not what you're supposed to do when the person is coming for three options. You help the person clarify and let the person choose the option. Uh, that's the only difference. Yes, Manpreet, thank you so much for bringing that up. That's something that a lot of leaders can benefit from. Let everybody come with a problem and three possible choices. It will build ownership for them. Um, it, it's, it's similar to what you were talking about, uh, the gentleman who leads the sales. Yes. And, uh, you know, if, if yours is the chosen uh, solution to go ahead with on experiment, it just brings greater ownership, responsibility. So, yeah, it, uh, it does work. Uh, now we have next question from Dipanshu and he says, uh, Nasreen, how do you encourage a coach to have peanuts when they don't want to have any? Because they have not <laughs> seen the benefits of having peanuts. Great question again, Dipanshu. Uh, so I think the, the blender I spoke to you about, uh, I think the mistake I made was that this person was, this, so very few people understand the difference between coaching, counseling, mentoring. One thing to do very, very carefully as a coach is to first tell people, listen, this is the coaching process. Uh, it's not that I want to leave you high and dry and not give you any answers. My job is to help you think. Uh, mm -hmm. And the best way, Dipanshu, that I've seen work is when you give them a little flavor of it, just a little flavor of how a few questions can help them think and then move forward, it normally helps. And Dipanshu, I know, is a great coach himself, so... Thank you for that question. Great. And, and I'm sure he's going to uh, move from being good to great to uh, best in his coaching trajectory with this insight from you, Nasreen. And uh, we have another one from Sujata, and she says she needs some guidance on best way to manage young adult and teenagers along with mid midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, young adults and teenagers. I think uh, Sujata, right? Yes, Did Sujata. Question? Okay. Sujata, um, one thing for that I've learned again with, uh, with uh, I think a lot of learning comes the hard way, is that what has shifted for teenagers and youngsters is that Google has all the answers. Okay, when, when I was younger, even if I had to make a gajar ka halwa, I had to call up my mother. Okay, <laughs> now if I have to make any exotic, uh, some Korean dish also, I will just Google it and I can make it. OK, so what's happened is that the equation between parents and children has shifted and parents haven't shifted. Children have been brought born into Google. OK, so I think uh, one thing that you may find and I'm, I'm going to pick up from one of my uh, clients who I, I just finished work with uh, two weeks ago. She did a beautiful thing. She asked her teenage son, what would he like her to do with him? As in what's something they could do together? He said, mom, you're too old, but if you could go jogging with me, I would like it. This, this sounds like this, this, this is really tough. tough. <laughs> and then, will you believe, Kriti? She told me that in our, in our last conversation that she's been going uh, in the morning with him, and they've. So that's the only time where she's not telling him what to do. She's only finding out how his day was, what has he been doing, how his friends are, and things like that. And it's uninterrupted time because both of them are. And, and she says she lost some weight. She's jogging. But of course, everybody will do it differently. But my point is that you need to spend some time with them without an agenda of saying you haven't eaten the right food, you got up too late, you're not wearing the right clothes, you're not studying hard enough, uh, you know, without that advice. So I think that might just help. Oh, my God, that sounds like me with my 21 year <laughs> Um, Nasreen, I sure have taken an, uh, another tip from you today on being a better mother and spending quality non-agenda time uh, with my son. But I have an interesting question from Sridhar. Uh, he says he is 48 um, and he's losing focus, energy, momentum, interest in life from a professional angle. How can, um, he asks, I change myself and take a leadership role and earn more money and professionally successful? I want to gain a more positive outlook. So any tips for him? Sridhar, first of all, I'm so glad you're even looking at changing this. This is this is the first step. The fact that you want to do it, it's a step in the right direction. So, so great. So yes, uh, the simplest thing to do, Sridhar, what you could do now is there has to be, there would have been times in your life where you fairly, really felt energized. Have a look at your 
at those times where you really would you were doing a project you forget about the time you are doing some work you don't remember where it went where time went what has energized you in the past in fact if shridhar if you connect with me one on one i'll send you a little exercise to do which you can do on your own um uh, and just it helps you find purpose back in life and we can do that i'm so glad you brought that up but keep thinking of what you have vis-a-vis -vis what you don't have Mm. even if this is happening with you if this would if you weren't feeling lost you wouldn't change anything so i'm glad so glad you're feeling lost so that's a great step forward uh, uh, happening there shridhar so um yes nasreen acknowledgement is um and taking just stock of what you're feeling itself is the first step towards the right journey and i'm sure working with you um you know on one one uh, one to one basis shridhar will find um the next trajectory also i have a very interesting question uh, from praveen he says in a train respond in a socially graceful acceptable manner when someone asks us a difficult question but you know you may not derive happiness in doing so so how do you handle this situation uh, would you just repeat that for me in the normal i couldn't hear that in normal um, you know our conditioning our normal brain says that um, you have to respond gracefully in a socially acceptable manner when someone asks you a difficult question but um, you know in doing so you may not uh, be you and you may not drive the happiness so how does one handle this situation uh praveen uh, very interesting question and i'll tell you that there's a technique that i learned to handle these uh, through questions and also to buy time to choose the response So let's say somebody asks you an uncomfortable question, you really don't want to answer it. So the first thing, instead of getting irritated, is to say, "Oh, that's interesting." So what you're doing is you're buying time. Uh, so that's interesting. And uh, what makes you think so, or what makes you want to know? So you've got the question back to that person, and you moved away from that question. What makes you want to know has gone back to that person. Okay, it's moved away from the question. So the person will say something or the other, and you'll be able to shift the conversation instead of answering that question. just try it and see it works uh, there is also a talk i don't remember the name of it but there is a how to answer uh, answer personal question that you don't how to handle personal question that you don't want to answer i don't remember the exact name of the talk but it has three steps to it the first one is by time by saying okay uh, that's an interesting question the second one is to say okay um, uh, so why would you want to know Mm. and then third is to ask a counter question to whatever the person says by the time the person has got deflected wow i am sure that's helpful and is going to help uh, the gentleman asking the question i have another one from suvidha uh, shrivastava and she says how do you calm yourself um, you know calm your anxiety just before you're getting into an important meeting or a talk um how do we practice calmness especially if you are a leader representing a function great question suvida and i think uh, one of the reasons it's a, it's a good question to ask yourself to say okay what is making me nervous mm -hmm. and you may discover that possible answer that could come up is that you are you know you feel responsible for ensuring things happen well uh, you could discover that you're feeling underconfident about the subject on hand whatever it is and then move it to say how can i feel more confident so saying how can i what are two things i can do to feel more confident and of course suvida since i know you uh breathing uh, breathing and and the confident stance uh, is a great exercise to do uh, of course i'm telling and i'm not asking but uh, just look at who is it by somebody must in the ch chat window can you put who is that confident stance by i forget her name uh anyway i can always send it to you suvida but it's about taking control of your thoughts what's happening at that moment are there is a lot of many negative thoughts coming up mm. so each negative thought you can counter by asking saying is that really true so you know you feel that once i get in the moment i open my mouth uh, they are all going to laugh does that always happen to me has how many times it happened will it really happen what else can i do by the way what else is a beautiful question what else can i do is one of the most powerful questions for yourself and for the others is what else can you do if what if you got stuck ask what else can you do i i know we are running out of time but uh, looking at the um, number of questions that i still have and more flowing in nasreen is it okay if we 
um take another 5 uh, 10 minutes so sure, sure more than happy so i have a question from a young 23 24 year old or maybe even younger just noor and she says how do we ask difficult questions uh which you know may hurt the other person uh but um, still asking them without leaving them in a bad taste actually i'd love to know what when she says difficult questions what does it mean is the feeling that the person might get hurt or may get defensive possibly it's coming like that just no i'm guessing but uh, yes, it's uh, coming more from a place of um, the other person may feel hurt yeah sure so uh, one of the things to do this first of all is to not go directly to the difficult question set a base for it set a context for it and say there's something i want to discuss with you is the person in the right frame of mind that's really really critical then you may move to saying okay can you lead up to that so called final difficult question and if you can make it two ways it just becomes that more you know if it would really help me understand why you're so rude to me okay is a is a question which is really can hit somebody really badly if you shift it and say it i i wanted to tell you that sometimes i feel hurt by the way you speak and i'm wondering is there something i could do the same thing is going to happen but the person is not going to be defensive and still going to get the message so you can shift the question to yourself and still ask it of what is it doing to you what is that difficult behavior doing to you that may just make it easier this is this is just um, so powerful just a shift in perspective and the way you ask the question just can completely change the dynamics nasreen that's the beauty of always working with you and uh, i can just keep going on and on about what i have learned from you but i have a very good question from saba here and she says how do i become at peace with whatever situation life puts me in i seem to be waiting for a better time and then look back to realize that the past was better <laughs> how beautiful is that <laughs> Yeah so I think uh, one of the things and I am so glad she's asked this question Sabha great question because a lot of people um and a lot of us being human one of the things that we which helps us grow is also not being happy with what we have today so there is a there is a certain amount of pressure that has to keep pulling us forward so some amount of saying okay I want to get better at this but what if you could Sabha look at today and say this is most beautiful and here are the things i am grateful for and for whatever you're looking for ask the question what is one thing i can do to move towards that what if you tried that and ask if you can ask there's another question which i just asked you actually is a what if question what if this happened so just putting yourself out there uh, to the future may start propelling you to do something there and accepting and looking at the gratitude today so keeping that balance is going to help uh and we continue to get the accolades uh, specifically on your response on how to handle a difficult question and a difficult situation and the tone and tonality uh and all of that um, you know lots of accolades coming in but the time clock is clicking uh, <laughs> clicking, uh nasreen Uh, and i have to tell you every interaction with you has always been enriching for me and this usb conversation was no different i was super thrilled to be in conversation with you because i knew i'm not going to just ask you questions but take away a lot uh from this conversation so thank you for sharing the secret ingredients to true happiness decisive optimism and personal responsibility of taking charge of one's life to be a happy person and an effective leader any closing thoughts tips that you want to share with us uh, nasreen mm uh, i can't have closing thoughts i can only have closing questions <laughs> <laughs> so to whoever is attending this uh, it would be just so beautiful if you could just take a moment to think about what are three words that you would like to be described by mm. at your workplace for example what are just three words when people think about you what are those three words that should come up for them you can put them in the chat box you can just think about it that's all that is fine but just leading leading a more intentional life uh, kriti mm. it it really changes things so instead of my just moving somewhere and people thinking something about me can i decide how i want to be seen because then my actions will get driven from there a more insightful life and for that you need to continue asking 
good questions. The marvelous thing about good question is that it shapes our identity as much by just asking as it does by answering. These questions always have something to do with how you might be more generous, more courageous, more present, more dedicated, more, more optimistic. I've just given you all the words that perhaps all of us want to be known by. And you know, also sometimes uh, Nasreen, the timing of when you ask these questions True. is just the right one. And it just opens the door and you may just step through that doorway into something bigger, better, both beyond yourself and yet more of yourself at the same time. Uh, I'm sure all of us who have joined us today have learned the immense power of good questions and how they shape our life. And most importantly, gained actionable tips on how we can make these work for us to take charge of your life. Once again, thank you, Nasreen, for joining us today and sharing such valuable insights, real life stories. Um, I, I cannot thank you enough. And on that thank note, you so much. And on that note, also a big thank you to our audience. You've just been exceptional. So thank you for joining us today and making this conversation more enriching with your questions and participation. We hope you are enjoying TOSP conversations. Every week, we attempt to bring varied experts to talk about topics most relevant to the world we are living in today. You can find TOSP on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to stay tuned to all these exciting conversations. If there's something you want, to talk about, learn more about, do write in to us. We would love to hear from you because as we say at TOSB, meaningful conversations are always the first step towards meaningful change. Be curious, ask better questions and stay optimistic. Bye for now from all of us at the Outstanding Speakers Bureau.